So they say that the master system game library is relatively small. In my case, no shit. Obviously with the NES and the SNES being the dominant consoles in the 80s and 90s respectively, one would expect the resulting game libraries to be somewhat larger. The NES had over 700 games in total over its lifespan, while its competitor the Sega Master System had only just over 300. Despite the Master System's smaller game collection, it did actually manage to produce several successful titles. There was, of course, Sonic the Hedgehog, Sega's mascot character, Fantasy Star became a landmark role-playing game, and Mickey Mouse's Illusion series was very popular. Well, I do have Sonic 2, but that'll have to wait for another time, considering that I haven't played the first one yet. In fact, I don't see why I didn't just buy the first one to begin with. Uh, Transbot? No. Just, uh... Just no. What else have we got? Huh. Asterix and the Lucky Dime Caper starring Donald Duck. Asterix for the Master System, average rating of 96%. Lucky Dime Caper, average rating of 92%. I don't believe this. I've had two of the best Master System games in my minuscule collection this entire time. The Lucky Dime Caper, starring Donald Duck, was released on the Master System and Game Gear back in 1991. I'm told it follows in a similar style to Mickey's Castle of Illusion, a side-scrolling platform game with different stages featuring several enemies and pitfalls to negotiate. Apparently it was one of the Master System's most successful games, often ending up in the top 10 or 20 lists. The same goes for Asterix, which was also released in 1991. I'm told this was the first of three Asterix games playable on the Master System, and it was praised for its representation of the popular comic series of the same name. Well, I guess I'll be looking at Asterix at some point in the future, but for now, seeing as his friend Mickey got a lot of attention on the Master System, let's take a look at The Lucky Dime Caper, starring Donald Duck. The game starts off with a sweet enough opening scene. Uncle Scrooge, or Uncle Scrooge as his nephews call him, gives each of them a dime and in the way that kids do, they show their appreciation. There's actually a nice little message to younger kids here as Scrooge tells them that his entire fortune started from a lucky dime and that the money you have can be lucky for you if you work hard. Anyway, Huey, Dewey and Louie along with their dimes are suddenly carried away by birds and Majika Dispel I just love that name, drops in and steals Scrooge's lucky dime. Majika Dispel is a sorceress with the plan of using them to become even richer than he is. So her plan is to simply become richer than Scrooge by having only four dimes more than he does? That's not much of a plan. Well, actually, in her first official story, The Midas Touch, back in 1961, Majika's plan is to steal Scrooge's lucky dime in order to make a magical amulet to grant her infinite riches. Well, I suppose we could assume she's trying something like that again, but it's never clarified. Anyway, Donald is given the task of finding Huey, Dewey and Louie and the Lucky Dimes in exchange for some kind of reward. I just love how Scrooge starts off by saying, we have to get back the Lucky Dime, but then sends Donald off on his own. So Donald takes off in his aeroplane. Wait a minute, Donald has an aeroplane? And goes to find Huey, Dewey and Louie. This is where the actual gameplay starts. Each nephew is located at different stages or locations. Huey is located in the Andes Mountains, Dewey is in the Great American Forest, and Louie is in the Northern Woods. Uh, you can choose which nephew you want to go after, but strangely, if you want to go in order from top to bottom, then the names are somehow reversed. So I guess I'll be going after Louie first.
The game is a basic side-scroller with Donald as the only playable character. The first thing that comes to mind is how great the game looks. The design and the animation are very well done for the time. Donald especially looks good with the way he walks and moves. He waddles along, at times almost to the music, and I just love how he shivers and sweats depending on which climate he's in. In some cases, he even freezes and burns up when he dies. So, the idea, as one would expect, is to simply get to the boss fight at the end of each level in order to save each nephew. Donald has to kill enemies along the way, and he does that with either a cartoony oversized mallet or an unlimited supply of frisbees. Now, each weapon seems to have its strengths and weaknesses, depending on which enemy you're fighting. Speaking of enemies, the ones in this game are very well designed, with great themes and variety, but they do have a bit of a learning curve. Take this toadstool, for example. Whenever I swing the mallet, it drops down so I can't hit it. The only way to kill it at this point is to jump attack. Not a huge problem, but it is something you have to remember. The same goes for the rest of the game, but I'll come back to that. So, the first minor issue I have with this game is the way your lives work. You see, there is no health meter as such. Instead, whichever weapon Donald is carrying acts as a sort of life support, if you will. The way it works is that Donald can take one hit from an enemy, but that will make him lose whichever weapon he has at the time. Now, you can keep going, but jump attacks are all you have until you find another weapon. These are sometimes dropped by enemies after you kill them. Enemies will also drop other items, like extra lives, and these stars that can actually be quite helpful. The more stars you collect, the faster your attack becomes, and if you collect enough, you become invincible, albeit for a very short amount of time. I'd say collecting weapons from enemies can be a minor issue, because sometimes you can't really proceed unless you have a weapon. Take this section, for instance. I lose my mallet and then I have to try and get past this statue. I, I, I don't know how else to get past him besides jumping on him, which proves impossible. It is possible to find a new weapon by scrolling back and killing respawned enemies. I just wish I'd known that earlier on. Plus, I'm wary of the time limit. Oh, speaking of which. Unlike Super Mario Bros., where the time limit is inanely unfair, this game's time limit is the exact opposite. It's actually a bit strange. The limit is shown as a blue bar at the bottom of the screen. This ticks down and changes colour to yellow when it gets low. You'd think this adds a sense of urgency, but the time limit isn't an issue for me. Why? Well, because the time limit resets itself whenever Donald enters a new section of the level. Whenever you walk through a door, which can only take a matter of seconds in this game, the time limit goes straight back to blue. It's never an issue. I don't really know if this is a good thing or a bad thing. I mean, I've never really liked time limits in computer games. I've always found them unnecessary. But at the same time, I've always appreciated the sense of having an extra challenge to get from one side to the other within the time limit. So my opinion is somewhat mixed about it in this case. Timing a jump or attacking an enemy can be crucial at times. You need to have a good deal of patience to get through certain obstacles. You also need to learn how to time your actions so you don't end up missing a moving platform or whatever. The boss fights are something of a mixed bag. Sometimes they can be really easy and sometimes they can take a few attempts. As mentioned, getting through a boss fight can also depend on the kind of weapon you have. It's a bit of a shame that the weapon system is random and you can't choose which weapon to use. Also, once again, it's essential to learn the boss's moves and attacks so you don't get caught out. The bosses are generally well thought out, though, and like Donald, they have a great look and nice cartoony animation. I must admit, even the first boss fight took me a couple of tries before I nailed it. Anyway, I got to the end of the level and rescued Louie, so now it's off to the Great American Forest to rescue Dewey. This is probably the nicest looking of the first three stages. <laughs> oh yeah, the game actually has seven stages, not just these three, but we'll get to that later. It looks really nice, and everything fits in well with the theme. I particularly like the riding of the tortoise across the water, while at the same time having to avoid the jumping fish, and these eagles that chuck boulders at you. This level even has the traditional underwater swimming level that a lot of 8-bit platforms have. It's almost a bit of a shame, though, that this is the only one that there is, and it doesn't even last that long. This level doesn't prove too difficult. Donald defeats the beautifully designed lion boss and rescues Dewey. Well, well... So far, so good, I guess, but I have a feeling things are going to get a bit more difficult as I go on. 
I am enjoying this game though. There may be parts of it that are a little frustrating, but it manages to stay appealing to me. It's making me curious to move forward with it. Well, on to the Hueys to find Andy. This level is probably the worst looking of all of them. I mean, it's okay, but there's something not quite right about it. I think it might be the colours, they just seem a bit off, and the scenery looks a little bit sparse. The enemies on this level aren't great either, particularly these weird bouncing head things, which I'm told are actually supposed to be pots or vases. There are also these weird looking caped figures with rolling pins, which apparently are supposed to be pigs. I mean, do they look like pigs to you? There are also eagles or vultures that drop these green things, which I'm guessing are supposed to be cactuses, but they don't look like cactuses to me. I don't know why, but I keep thinking they're watermelons. I think this level is the least creative out of all of them. There's this section where Donald simply walks down a hill whilst jumping over blocks that come his way. It gets faster and it's a bit of a challenge, but it's not tricky once you learn the pattern. It's a bit silly and unnecessary. It feels like someone may have run out of ideas when designing this level. It does, however, provide a little bit of a challenge when I have to destroy the sections of this weird moving wall and then dodge these blue blocks that fly at me. This takes me a few tries because, as mentioned, it takes time to learn the pattern. <sighs> I don't mind admitting that this level does take me a lot of tries to get through. Yeah, the design uh, isn't up to much, but there is a bit more of a learning curve to it. There's a lot of movement and unpredictable traps to master, some patience was required for this one. Finally made it to the boss fight, and like the rest of the level, this one isn't the best to look at. Two statues chuck boulders down at you, and that's pretty much it. Ah, now, remember how I said that killing an enemy depends on the weapon that you have? Well, this is a perfect example of that. I have absolutely no idea what to do at first. I tried jumping on the statues, but obviously I wasn't high enough. I, I tried throwing my frisbee, but that wasn't doing anything. I thought that I must need the mallet, so I deliberately died and played the whole level again to try and get it. But that didn't work either. I'm stumped. But then I discovered something. Donald is able to throw his frisbees upwards. Once I discover that, all I have to do is this. Well, maybe a few difficulties along the way, but I'm still enjoying the game for the most part, and I still feel the urge to carry on. Huey, Dewey and Louie are rescued, so now it's on to find the lucky dimes, and it looks like this is where it gets interesting. Stage 4 takes place on some sort of tropical island, I'm guessing Hawaii. As I said, this is where the game gets interesting and I dare say more challenging. As far as looks and design goes, this level is my personal favourite. It's very bright and cheery and the music is upbeat and thematic. The music in this game is sort of good and bad at the same time. It's good in that it's catchy and very well done considering the limitations at the time, but it can sometimes get a bit repetitive and annoying in that sense. The music tracks only last about 20 seconds, and I wish they could be a bit longer before starting to loop. Overall though, they are enjoyable music tracks that suit the game well, and as I said, this one is one of my favourites. I also like this level because it keeps you on your toes. There are a hell of a lot of moments where everything happens all at once, and you haven't much time to think. I like levels like this. Just look at this section. There was absolutely no way I could know this thing was going to tongue me to death. There are a lot of other things to dodge on this level too, mostly involving fire and lava. Once again, it's a question of getting the timing right. Speaking of timing, take a look at this section. Ah! <laughs> Look, look, I'm not saying I mind the challenge. I've managed sections like this in games before, but what makes this particularly difficult is the controls, which in this game, I can only describe as sluggish. Trying to control Donald as he jumps through the air can be incredibly frustrating. There's a very small delay in the movement, which may not sound like much, but with sections like this, it can make all the difference. Another issue here seems to be the old Master System controller. If you take a look at the Master System controller and compare it with the NES controller, you can see that the layout is similar, but there's one big difference, the directional pad. 
The NES directional pad is a simple up, down, left and right, while the Master System directional pad has an additional four diagonal options. Now, I'm not saying that these diagonal controls don't work. They do, under the right circumstances, but because of the way the pad is designed, it can be a bit of a pain in the ass as well. See, if my thumb is pressing down on the right, sometimes the pressure will either be a millimetre too high or too low, making the controller think that I'm pressing one of the diagonals. This doesn't always have to be much of a problem, but when trying to control a character while jumping, like I'm trying to do here, it can make things twice as difficult. As you can see, it's taking me so many tries to get across this damn section, and the section that follows isn't much easier. These red things drop from the ceiling and make the blocks disappear. The idea is that Donald has to avoid being hit while at the same time trying to descend to the lower level. You'd think this shouldn't be too hard, but it gets difficult when you can no longer see where the red things are going to drop, and you can't always get out of the way in time. <laughs> I'm actually being a bit naughty here and trying to cheat. I realised that it's possible to balance on the edge in order to get the red things to drop. I thought I had succeeded, only to find that when I drop down, I've caused a glitch in the game, and the blocks are no longer disappearing. Don't ever cheat, kids. It gets you nowhere. Well, after many, 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 many attempts, I finally made it to the boss of this stage. Some sort of exotically dressed bird throws bombs and swoops down at me. As you can see, the pattern of this one is very easy to pick up. This is actually the easiest part of the whole level. I don't even need a weapon. Anyway, I got rid of him and collect the first lucky dime. The next level is the Egyptian Pyramids. The Egyptian Pyramids is another well-designed level with more great thematic music. The enemies can be a bit tricky here though. The movements are very erratic and you need to know the right time to attack. The enemies here do look great though. Scorpions, bats, flying arrows to dodge, quicksand, snakes and even mummies. This level is probably the right amount of difficult for me. It's not too easy, but it's not too difficult either. There is, however, one section that proves to be a bit tricky. The aforementioned mummies are a pain in the ass. There's this whole line of coffins Donald has to get past, and there's no telling which one will open. The mummies just come out, seemingly at random, and can make a dash for you. Just look at how cautious I'm being here, taking a swipe at each coffin. The boss of this level is probably the most creative. I like the design of this one. This bird flying overhead is playing a tune to make a giant snake rise out of the baskets. The snake spits some sort of projectile at Donald, which he has to avoid, but the clever thing here is how to beat it. You can't kill the snake, you have to kill the bird, and the only way to get up to him is to stand on the snake to raise you up, but yet again you have to time it well because the snake's tongue can cause you damage. Ugh. The one really annoying thing about this boss fight is the bird. He throws these musical notes down at you and they cause you damage if they hit you. But unlike the spitting snake, which is easy to avoid, the musical notes are difficult to see due to the dark background. Plus, you're so busy trying to get to the snake that it can become a distraction. But I'm nitpicking here. It's a good boss fight uh, with just the right amount of skill required. I collect the second lucky dime and now it's off to the penultimate level. I admit I'm getting kind of excited now, I'm eager to finish. The penultimate level is the South Pole, and this one is very cleverly challenging and requires patience to get through. The most notable challenge is the blizzard. See those snowflakes that fall periodically? The direction they fall randomly changes from left to right, so the wind direction can either push you back, making your efforts twice as difficult, or push you forwards, helping you get across larger gaps. It's a very clever but very trying obstacle. The hardest part is timing my jumps with the blizzard to make it over these gaps with the leaping swordfish. Another obstacle to get through are these fierce looking snow creatures. Watch this. It took me a minute to work out what killed me here. If you look closely you can see that the snow creatures, I think they're supposed to be some sort of yeti, actually throw projectiles at you. But I didn't see it here because of the blizzard. Here it is again. The boss fight is another example of how essential a particular weapon can be. I first tried this boss fight with no weapon, and it was noticeably more difficult. But now I'm armed with the frisbees, and it suddenly becomes easier, albeit time consuming. But I make it through and collect the final lucky dime. Phew! So, overall, the game has taken me about three hours to get this far. Not bad, considering, as mentioned earlier, this game is challenging and it can get very frustrating at times, but 
The urge to continue is always present. I I'm very eager to get to the end of the game. The gameplay is very cleverly designed to the extent that even the challenging and frustrating bits are challenging and frustrating in the right kind of way. Frustrating doesn't always have to mean annoying, and it certainly doesn't in this case. Well, on to the final level, the castle of Magica Dispel. Magica's castle is somewhere in Italy on the map, but by the looks of it, I guess it was closer to Transylvania. Once again, we have a very creatively designed level. There are weird skeleton guys who chuck bones at you. What look like flying pitchforks, a bit of a weird one there, falling paintings and a plethora of spikes to avoid. Also, of course, no haunted castle level would be complete without ghosts, and this level doesn't disappoint in that department. There are tons of them. There is a hell of a lot of platform jumping in this level, and it all has to coincide with the avoiding of enemies and the spike traps. Looking back to the trouble I had earlier with the controls, I have a feeling this is going to try my patience. This is also a level where I have to take a lot of breaks, mostly due to my left thumb starting to hurt from mashing the directional pad so much. Unfortunately, there's no pause option during the gameplay. The only time you can actually stop for a breather is either on the map screen or the continue screen, which will just remain as it is, with Donald showing his traditional short-tempered side until you're ready to try again. Speaking of continues, one of the major pluses of this game, in my opinion, is unlimited continues, and more importantly, whenever you run out of lives, of which you have three to begin with, you don't have to go all the way back to the beginning of the game. You start at the beginning of the level you died at. Now, I appreciate that some gamers don't like this option for the sake of challenge, but for me, it's a major plus. Okay, here we go, almost there. Just need to avoid the spikes and make it to the bottom of this section. Not too difficult, as long as I can remember all of the movements at the right time. Jump here, duck there, uh, make it all the way to the... Damn it! Okay, no problem, I'll try again. Jump here, more ducking here, all the way to the right, and then jump it. Whoa, 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 steady, steady, steady. Uh, okay, yes, 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 uh, come on, uh, just one more to go, and then... What the hell was that? All I did was walk off the platform towards the gap, but the hit detection thought otherwise. Look at it in slow motion. Does it look like I touched the spikes to you? Ugh. Damn you, Donald. I am this close to the end and I am not giving up. There is nothing that can stop me getting to the end of this game. Okay, jump, duck, jump again and move to the side. Damn it! Look, it was that again. All I did was brush the side of the spikes and I died. The hit detection in this game isn't up to much, but I'm determined. Just one more try and I'll get there. Uh, uh, jump, duck, uh, dodge, move to the side, uh, uh, wait here and then jump. Oh, damn it! Oh, keep, keep going. Come on, keep going. Come on, Donald, you can do it. Uh, uh, jump, duck, uh, move all the way to the side. Oh, damn it! I, I didn't even touch anything that time. Okay, so back at the continue screen. That's fine. I've got unlimited continues. All I have to do is press the yes button and it I cannot believe what just happened. All I did was hit the A button to continue, but what do I get? I get the damn game over screen and suddenly that's the end of it. I mean, three and a half hours completely wasted and all because of this damn controller. I was so close too. I don't think this has ever happened to me before in all the time I've spent playing computer games. I must have been only minutes away from defeating the final boss, which apparently is one of the easiest bosses to defeat. And then something like this happens. Donald, you're angry, and so am I. Well, overall, The Lucky Dime Caper starring Donald Duck is a fun and engaging game. Despite the sometimes frustrating and very trying moments, the game knows how to keep you playing and eager to make it through to the end. 
It looks amazing and keeps in tone with the traditional animation style of Donald Duck. It's very cartoony, as one would want it to be, with enough variety in the design and gameplay to stop it becoming boring. The music is a 50-50 split. Sometimes it's refreshingly thematic, but sometimes it's repetitive and maybe a little annoying and out of place. It's generally not bad for the time, though. This isn't a flawless game, if there is such a thing, but I would say, if you have the patience and the nerve, the pluses certainly outweigh the minuses. The replay value is very high, and even now, I can feel the urge to play through the whole thing again and make it to the end. And I will. God as my witness, I will get that last lucky dime. Magica Dispel, we shall meet again, and if you think this is game over, well then, you can go and pluck yourself!